But that was, in fact, a theory that you, you end up with less urban blight when people own homes as opposed to renting in, in tenements in the, in, the, in the inner city. And we're going to see in a second how that has now turned itself upside down and inside out. Uh, policy of pushing home ownership, psychology, the massive flipping properties, all again at 1%. You know, you go to a cocktail party and everyone's talking about Bernie Madoff. When you went to a cocktail party, everyone was talking about the condo. They just put $100,000 down. They're going to hold it, not going to close on it, and they're going to sell it for, uh, you know, a million four when, in fact, they paid a million three. They put a hundred down. Now they made $200,000. I mean, you know, it was like printing money for people because they just thought it was just going to keep going up and up. So do it again. You pay you. You put down a hundred. Let's say the unit was a million two, and you sold it for a million four. You just made two hundred thousand dollars. You didn't even close. In fact, the IRS took the position that if you held it for a year, that could have been characterized as a capital gains. You never even owned it, but you owned the contract for a year. So if you owned the contract for a year, that was a capital gains. And let's talk about capital gains. I think one of the biggest uncharacterized causes of the bubble has been the differential in capital gains from ordinary income. And in fact, where's Stuart Slusky? Stuart? Stuart and I talked about this. I, I used to talk to Stuart, and I say, Stuart, I find it offensive that my income is taxed at a, at a lower rate, and therefore I can keep more of it when I'm not producing a service and when I'm making money as an investor. And I said, you know, what the government is saying is that my services, my value as a human being, is less than my value when, in fact, I make money investing. And I, and I found it offensive at the time, and I saw that psychologically I was highly motivated by a differential in that tax. And I think that one of the things we all should be looking at is not rewarding investment as much and, and, and rewarding labor and treating income as income. And I don't see why you know, we need to, to characterize one differently than the other. I think if we brought the capital gains tax up and we brought the regular income tax down, I think we'd actually create more value and, and allow people to have more money and therefore they, they could spend more money and we, we could dig ourselves out of this in part by allowing people to, uh, to actually shop, which is what I guess uh, uh, George Bush said after 9-11. After um, in 2006, Freddie Mac, this is fascinating, in, in 2006, Freddie Mac had a model that they would remain solvent provided real estate prices did not drop below 13.6%. And that's kind of interesting because they, as well as all the really super smart people who went to these great Ivy League schools and who studied uh, economics and work for all these top firms and get you know billion, millions of dollars a year in, uh, in bonuses, never took into account something I talked about two or three years ago. And you guys didn't know what I was talking about at the time. It was called the black swan event. Okay, what is a black swan event? A black swan event is when you don't anticipate something that may, in fact, happen. So Freddie Mac chose not to model themselves over what would happen if real estate prices dropped 15% or 20% or 25% or, God forbid, 30%. But we already talked about the fact that during the Depression, real estate prices dropped 30%. So why weren't they modeling at 30%? Okay? The reason they weren't modeling at 30% is because the, the, the executives and the salaries that they were paid and the bonuses that they would have been paid, they couldn't have received because they would have had to have kept a lot more money in reserve. And that goes the same thing for every major investment bank that was involved in the subprime mortgage business. What they did, and anyone read the New York Times Magazine this weekend? Anyone read it? Good. No one read it. Good. That means I can talk about it. What happened is, what happened is, is that all the modeling that was done on Wall Street did not take into account the possibility that a, a large chunk of these mortgages would fail. And so what you would have is effectively a banana. You'd have this banana, and this banana would be valued, okay? It would be valued that it looked pretty. It was either green or a little yellow. But they didn't value the banana knowing that the next day or the next week or the next month that banana would start to wilt, it would rot, and it would pee, be, end up being a piece of garbage. And so what these guys did, what these, uh, these economists did when they valued all these portfolios is they only went back two years. Instead of going back 10 years or 20 or even 30 years and going back to depression, saying, what would happen if these mortgages dropped in value? And that was not done. And so you end up having garbage in, garbage out. Now, why did they not do that? Why did these, these guys, these, uh, what, what are they called? They're called, uh, what's the word when you're? That's right. Thank you. And they're soothsayers. Um, do this. They, they do this for the simple reason that their bonuses are based on an annual, on an annual assessment. So if the assessment is only based on the two prior years, Obviously, that banana looks ripe and it looks beautiful. 
But when you're not factoring in the fact that this banana is going to rot, and we know it's going to rot, or we should have known or could have known that it's going to rot, none of that money was put in escrow for, let's say, three to five years, and then those bonuses would, would have been, been eligible. And in fact, a lot of the folks who are talking about what happened here are saying that these bonuses were really not earned. In fact, Merrill Lynch, if all the bonuses that had been paid in the last 15 years were put back on the table, Merrill still would have been insolvent. But at least maybe they, 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 they could have remained a, 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 so, a sovereign entity. Anyway, the word I'm looking for, by the way, is quant. These are, quant, these are guys who had these quant, quant, quantitative models. And you know, no one understands them, and they're really esoteric, and these people are usually PhDs. And these quantitative models only went back two years when they were valuing the, the mortgage portfolios, these subprime mortgage portfolios. And so when they were sold, no one took into account that that banana was going to rot. Very, very simple. So when you ask yourself you know, how smart these people are, they're really not that smart. In fact, what I think they are is that they're too smart for themselves, and, that, and that's my big problem here. Uh, OK, we talked about the black swan. We can go on. The history of home values. OK, what we see is from 1890 up through 2000, we see this, this huge hockey puck. I think we talked about this hockey puck once, once before. And uh, this is what happened up, up through 2000. Now we see what happens after 2000. 10 city composite index, we see basically <laughs> the flip side of the, it, this is actually the same hockey puck, just inside out or upside down. It's, 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 it's just a reflection of itself going down. And um, this just wasn't factored in to these quantitative models. It w wasn't factored in to, to, to what Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or, or the Federal Reserve were thinking. And, and it, you know, I know you could say you're Monday night quarterbacking. We should have. We could. The bottom line is, is that the incentive structure that we have on Wall Street and some of the public policies that we have, as well as the oversight, is broken. Is broken. And, and, and President-elect Obama just, Obama just said it, I think, yesterday. He said, our economy is very sick. And it's sick because we have systemic issues that until we really, really address them, uh, we're not really going to get much better. Next. These are housing indexes by, by city. It's kind of interesting because certain cities have had more of a problem than, than other cities. Uh, I think we know it's obviously Miami. We know it's Vegas. We know it's Los Angeles. Uh, and then some of these other places we see, uh, the, the problem ha hasn't arisen as greatly because you have this great increase and you have this huge decrease. And down here, you have some places that just kind of just muddled along. Uh, let me see, what, what's this over here? This would be, uh, what's this? What's, what's this city is this? Can we tell? Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, well, they're going to have their problems. Well, I mean, Charlotte's kind of interesting because they, they're going to pick up Merrill Lynch and at the same time, uh, what bank, they lost Wachovia. You know, so maybe that, that will be somewhat of a, of a wash for them. But they never had the big spikes. Okay, next. Okay, I like this cartoon, the credit crunch. We see uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith is really holding up the entire economy. They got their house. Then they got their Jiffy mortgage. Those mortgages are supported by the banks. And then you got Wall Street that just pounced on everyone. And, and, it's, it's, it, and that's what's collapsing the whole thing. And uh, you, know, you, you, you ask yourself, where did the incentives go wrong? And you know, so you look at it and you say, OK, the Wall Street guys are getting paid all this money to package these mortgages from the banks and selling them to, to cities and countries you know, all over the world, not really disclosing to them what the real risks were. You had mortgage brokers primarily from countrywide who were more concerned about their commissions because they get paid weekly or, or every few days. Only one payment had to be made. You know that, right? You, made one, you had to make sure that, that when you sold a mortgage, when you initiated a mortgage, that the person made one payment. They made their one payment. You got your commission. And so I'm just curious what kind of deals were done on the side to make sure that person made that first payment. These were no doc loans. You didn't have to show income. You didn't need income. You could be dead. There were people who were borrowing money who had died. Um, OK, and then you got the homeowners, of course, who wanted the home. They wanted the home because of all the public relations and, and government policy of pushing people to want a home. And now these are the guys, you and me, who, who, are, who are really suffering, I, you know, I, I would argue, the most. And what's interesting, we're going to talk about the bailout. But we're going to talk about who has gotten the bailout. And I just want you to remember this picture as, as we. As we